Welcome to the Queen Anne's County School Board meeting for April the 6th, 2022. We'll have a motion to move into a closed session. Mr. Smith, pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain, obtain legal advice, and to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. Second. I have a motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We'll be back at six o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education for April the 6th, 2022. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, God and God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have the approval of the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Okay, you've had time to look at our approval of minutes for closed sessions to March the 6th. Have I had a chance to look at those? Yes. A motion. So moved. Second. A motion. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. We also had a chance to look at the uh, March minutes 16th for open session. Does everybody have a chance to look at them? Yes. Have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you, sir. Okay, our next part of this is one of our uh, student recognitions athletes. Dr. Samuels. Yes, um, I'd like to in invite up uh, Coach Holland, also Coach Park, Mr. Dan Harding, the AD, and Principal Ken Sarah. Hey. Yeah, so we have Sarah. <laughs> yep. Sarah. Yeah, we have 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 Sarah. Ye
in front. Air pop in front. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have Sarah now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so if I can have um, Coach Holland, Coach Park, uh, AD Dan Harding, and Principal Kenna to return, and we now have Sarah Van is it Ornum. Is that how you say it? Sarah Van Ornum. So Sarah is also another very special young lady. Um, and I'd like to, again, share a coach's um, ask comments on this, that Sarah was a dominant force in the distance running this year, running the gauntlet, is it four by, see, I'm not, four by eight, four by eight 800, 1,600, and 3,200. So four miles. So four miles. Okay. <laughs> Numerous times this year. She, she led the team in regional titles. She lost only once in the 800, finishing fourth at the state meet. Lost only once in the 1600, finishing third at the state meet. And was undefeated in the 3200, including a state championship. She led... <laughs> led the 4 by 18 to a second place finish at the state meet. She ran the gauntlet at the state meet, finishing with a first, second, third, and fourth. Congratulations, Jeff. with the Shining Star Award. This award recognizes someone in our school system who shines. Our April Shining Stars are the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Scholastic Art Award winners. So we have quite a number of them here this evening. And this is nominated, obviously, by Mr. Bell, who is our supervisor of visual and performing arts, world languages, and school library media. And jack of all trades, right? You are the duties at this time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So this award is being presented to 15 outstanding student artists who earned a total of 22 Scholastic Art Awards, which included two gold keys, four silver keys, and 16 honorable mentions. the nation's longest running and the most prestigious recognition program for students in the country. For a regional award, these students competed against students from Washington, D.C. to Maine. Submissions were judged um, anonymously by luminaries in the arts world and some not notable scholastic alumni, including... Go ahead. Sure. Andy Warhol, John Baldessari, Robert Redford, you may have heard of, Sylvia Plath, Truman Capote, and the youngest inaugural poet in U.S. history, Amanda Gorman. So these guys are very elite company. All gold key winners moved on to the national competition this year. We had our very first national gold medalist in the history of Queen Anne's County Public School, which represents 1% of our nation's student artists to earn this honor. So congratulations. You are all very elite, are all in very elite company. So starting with our first ever middle school scholastic award winner, please welcome Stevensville Middle School art teacher, Mrs. Holly Schrader. And her outstanding Grace Hartlove, who earned both a silver key and an honorable mention. Congratulations. Thank you. 
Are we going to do them all? Want to do them all? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. 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 Next, from Ken Allen High School, please welcome Art Department Chair, Mrs. Andrea Schulte, and the following 11 student artists who earned 14 total awards. Gabrielle Beamer, Carmen Bell, Marley Burr, McKenna Conley, Talia Crow, Talia, it's Talia. Yeah. I told you I went to that. So sorry, congratulations, Talia. Reese Delp, Rain Dietrichs. Jake Eater, Sophia, Jake is Jake, okay, Sophia Colabo, and Passion Carter. If our art teacher can maybe just share a little bit, if you wanted to share anything at all about this lovely group of students. We still got, we still got some more to go. Yeah. Okay. I still have plans. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought we would take a picture here, and then settle because we can get them all up here. Yeah. Okay. You want to do one at one faction at a time? I think so. Ken Island and then your Queen Anne's. I think so. Just because we'll have this space up here to take a picture of all of them. You got it. If we could get Mr. Bell, if you could stand behind Dr. Salins, and if we could get a couple students of passion, come over here, please. Just a little bit, please. Sorry, I don't okay, can't, I'm I'm get back any further. <laughs> 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 Please welcome up and congratulate the art department chair and lead art teacher, Miss Stephanie Seiler, and her student artists who earned six total awards. Those students, so those students can please come forward, Alyssa Barbonas, Claire Parker, and our district's first ever national gold medalist heading to the Carnegie Hall this June, Merakai Gardner. Congratulations to all of these artists for this incredible award. This one, thank you very much. A little bit more if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. So afterwards, is that what you want? Make sure any parents can get any pictures. Can you make sure they contact you and you can send them to us? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I'll, I have all the students' names, so I'm going to email all the photos to the parents as well as the students, okay? As long as I don't mess up names. <laughs> like me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next award is our Energizer Bunny Award. This award is given to a staff member who volunteers or keeps on going. It is sponsored by Bayview Financial, and I believe we do this evening have Mr. Chip Brittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys here. April's Energizer Bunny this year is Constant Del Nero, the Director of Children's Education and Community Programs at the Academy Arts Museum. If she could please come forward. Congratulations. 
Wow. <laughs> Congratulations so much. This award is being presented to you this evening. Um, Constant has been a strong partner of the county's visual arts teachers, creating opportunities for kids where there weren't any. For a recent collaboration for a group exhibition between Kent Island High School students and professional artists at the museum to host portfolio nights for students to get feedback on their artwork from some of the best art institutions and colleges around. Most recently, she helped relaunch the All Shore Art Exhibition at the Academy of Art Museums for K through 12 students, which is a long lasting tradition that everyone looks forward to each year. She even began a new paid teen internships initiative for under-resourced teens interested in arts and museums. As a native of the New Yorker, she definitely knows how to hustle to keep the visual arts thriving on the Eastern Shore. And for this, she is the epitome of the Energizer Bunny. And I did get to go there, and it was wonderful, the whole amazing. It was truly a wonderful experience. And while well, the talent that is there within our system that you are also helping us to bring out is amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. This award is given to an individual who embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. This year, for April, our winners are our very own Queen Anne's County Public School Visual Art Teachers. Of course, nominated by Mr. Bell, the supervisor. This award is presented to all of the visual arts teachers who have stepped up and created opportunities for students to exhibit their work in art shows and contests this year, which is so important to ensure our young artists are thriving in art. These Teachers have stepped up to ensure our programs have been seen and heard from the Youth Arts Month contest to statewide contests to Scholastics to the Academy of Arts Museum exhibition to our two upcoming district-wide art scenes shows everyone is looking forward to in April. I'm going to let you read this part. I'm from New York. Right. You are. Right. Yes. Just right here because you okay. Okay, well, I hope that we, you know, we're looking forward to seeing everyone at Queen Anne's County Art Scene Tuesday, April 26th, and Kent Island's Art Scene Thursday, April 28th, from 5 to 8 p.m., both shows free to the public. They're going to launch that whole week like fireworks across the district, so thanks for all your hard work and dedication and keeping the visual arts season alive. Thank you, Michael. And so I'd like to recognize our elementary art teachers first, Allison Dorsey from Kent Island Elementary School. Shannon Francis from Mattapique Elementary School. Erica Jensen from Kennard Elementary School. Megan Spence from Graysonville Elementary School. Lucia Callowell from Centerville Elementary School. 2022 Queen Anne's County Public School Teacher of the Year. And, and so Sydney Pedraza from Bayside Elementary School and Tara Bassey from Sellersville Elementary School. I'll hold on to that. Maybe we can get a picture sure. if you want to do all of them. Let's do all okay, sure. So, so middle school art teachers, Jacqueline Jablecki from Centerville Middle School. Holly Schrader from Stevensville 
Middle School. Estelle Zerba from Mattapique Middle School. And then for high school, we have for Ken Island High School, we have Andrea Schulte. And from Queen Anne's County High School, we have Valerie Ortez. And Stephanie Zeiler. See them if you're up front. Thank you very much. Okay. Congratulations. Yes. Moving on with a minute, our meeting, our next thing will be our board involvement. Um, well, Ellen, you like to? Sure. Um, I spent some time going to Kent Island to see a Little Mermaid, amazing. Um, and then I went to Queen Anne's High School and saw James and the Giant Peach, also amazing. We have some uh, incredible talent, not just from the um, singers and the actors, but the staged, you know, the set designs, the costumes, it was extremely impressive and it was a blessing to be able to go and then also just a shout out because our, our clay target team a first ever public uh, school in maryland team has started um, with their with their practices so it was a, a really good time so congratulations more accolades for the art department for those two plays it was amazing That's it. all right so i'm just happy to be here and uh Looking out and seeing a room full of smiling teachers. It really is a good sight to see. And um, and looking forward to uh, hearing what everybody has to say. Um, this past month is very busy. I uh, had a chance to meet with the state superintendent, discuss various county issues and local boards face. We also took a tour of uh, three restaurants uh, that our students are involved with in our culinary institute at Chesapeake College. That was very interesting. It gives them a chance to get out and really see the work workplace. Uh, also had a monthly meeting with the commissioners that we have just on a monthly basis current issues. At the request of the county, we also, with Dr. Sellers and some staff, had a meeting with our county officials to look at Everside Healthcare, which is something will give both the county employees and our school employees better health care access with our current insurance. And I something that we're looking at right now. Also, we the board finalized the 
proposed budget for the coming year, which addresses state mandates and other needs for our system. And I'd like to also note that we also have $3.7 million in there for salary and benefit enhancements to our staff. I concur Ms. Bennett's uh, comments about the two high school productions. I enjoy them thoroughly, uh, being a, a drama mama <laughs> all those years with my, my girls. Um, just overwhelmed and, and grateful to everyone behind the scenes, and that includes parents, because you know parents are a big part of those productions. I am looking forward to seeing how the state uh, finalizes the budget, uh, as well as the county commissioners, and looking forward to it all being done. So I'll triple that. Um both James and the Giant Peach and uh, The Little Mermaid were excellent. Very good shows to go see. Um, I was also able to um, be a judge at the Future Chef competition. Uh, watch the kids in the kitchen cooking. Um, I will tell you the only thing that made me nervous was the really little kid with the really big knife trying to cut tomatoes. <laughs> um, but he made a really good dish and it was very good. They so very good. they were all, it was very inspiring to see very young chefs. They were all middle school or elementary school? Elementary school. Elementary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the teachers, Teacher of the Year Gala, that was very good. Um, being able to recognize our Teacher of the Year and all the other teachers and um, employees and staff that got awards. That was a good time. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Salins? And really, I, I, this, this time I usually don't do this, but I really do have to echo that it was just so much fun to not only go to the gala and see so many people who well-deserved to be honored, but also our little chefs that I really felt like I was on a show, like it was that professional. Mm -hmm. And then the two plays were over the top, and um, I guess the only other thing is just really back engaging with our student groups and just listening to them and their ideas. The um, middle school groups have been working on designing the most optimal uh, summer school program in their eyes and the high school students have been working on um, what would the ideal freshman experience look like? What was this the best of the best, you know, if you could design it any way you want, what would it look like? So we're getting little bits and pieces from those and enjoying their ideas and creativity and thinking outside the box. So all of, all of the above. Thank you. Mr. Tudak. everyone. So I have for you the um, March spotlight. Got a lot of great things um, that went on during the month of March. This is a horrible picture of me. But um, <laughs> Cassie Hostler, our Teacher of the Year. So we're going to start off with, with that. An upbeat night it was a great, great evening. Um, and then our elementary schools. All right, so this is the competition that everyone was talking about, and I have names written in here, so I'm gonna go through my papers as well. Um, so we have Bayside fourth grader, Sydney Thompson. She won the Future Chef competition that was held at Queen Anne's County High School for the elementary um, students. Um, Centerville Elementary School, um, they celebrated St. Patrick's Day with their, their theme, they have the kindness grant, and then they also did um, read some texts that had a green theme. Churchill Elementary School, one of their priorities is family engagement. So they have two, the pictures here of two events that they held, a virtual pet show and the uh, fourth grade science night. And their pet show obviously was done. Yeah, that's really cool. Show, showing the talents of their, their pets. And then um, Graysonville Elementary School. So Gracie, I'll give you a little bit of a background on, on this. Gracie is their black lab. So that's why uh, this project is titled that. And it stands for Graysonville Raises Awareness for Community Interaction with the Environment. And you have pictures here showing students uh, working with other students, showing them how to compost. And then a group of the members went to Washington College on 
March 19th, and they attended the Upper Shore Youth Environmental Sum Summit. Um, then Ken Island Elementary School, we have three different things that are showcased. You have three, tri the, the triplets, I said three triplets, but the triplets um, assist with donations for a green school service project. And then you have um, first grade students that uh, completed, they did research and delivered presentations. And then you have uh, Principal Miss Cassandra Cornish sitting with a group of students playing the uh, contraction card game. And then Kennard Elementary School participated in the polar bear plunge um, and raised money for Special Olympics. Um, on here at the time that this was uh, put together, it says 3,000, but I think I heard a, a larger number than that at the principal's meeting. So I'm not sure, but they raised thousands of dollars for that initiative. All right, and then you have Mattapique Elementary School. And what they have here is an assembly, which they have not had one uh, for quite some time. I think that was the first one in two years is what um, some of the notes had said. Um, and then you have Reader's Theater, and they had an audience um, both virtual as well as in person. And then you have the Tooth Fairy that um, surprised a group of kindergarten students. So lots going on at Mattapique. Sudlersville Elementary School, This, uh, what you see here are multiple pictures of students participating in cooperative learning and um, it's being used to increase their student engagement. And then our middle schools. Um, the Saltana staff visited and worked with sixth graders and what they did was they um, looked at the topography of the campus and they also did some uh, water quality testing in the Corsica River. And this next picture shows the Boys and Girls Club and they came during their lunch and their recess and um, they introduced the students to uh, Club on the Go which is obviously the vehicle that you see in the picture. I thought that was very cool. Great opportunity for those kids. And then Mattapique Middle, you have Miss Yuna Matsui, who is the winner of Maryland's First Ladies Gallery Exhibit. And then you have um, Young Authors Contest. And what you have in the picture, you see um, short story category winners. And everybody won first place. And you have sixth grader Jeremy Nelson and seventh grader Alex Kuhn. And then in the poetry category, Emily uh, Dreyer and Kendall Fowler. Um, Emily is sixth grade and Kendall is eighth grade. So congratulations to those students. And then Stevensville Middle, you have um, a picture here of students participating in um, literature circles. Um, working through, and Ms. Passon would be very pleased to hear, the choice unit in English language arts classes. And then Southersville um, Middle School, it's the Junior Offshore Chorus. And um, they will participate this Friday at North Dorchester High School um, in the Shore Festival. <coughs> and then our high schools. Um, you have three different um, events here. You have the architecture and construction program working on a new storage shed, which is very hands-on. And then you have the uh, prom expo at, and they also crown Mr. and Mrs. Um, Ken Island during that event. And then you have four student athletes uh, that complete, uh, competed in the Adidas National Indoor Track Meet. And um, they earn third place finish. Queen Anne's County High School, these four ladies uh, represented Queen Anne's County High School in the senior, the, this year's Senior Offshore Honors Band. And then the picture on the right is the combined concert band and they traveled to North Dorchester High School. Um, and they received three superior ratings and those ratings were for stage performance, sight, reading, assessment, and overall uh, rating for the day. So congrats to those kids. And then we have some more art news. We have, and that is, I believe, Catherine 
Winterstein, uh, who uh, just was recently honored for the Governor's Healthcare on, uh, Heroes poster competition. And she's an eighth grader at Southersville Middle. And then we have the outstanding arts educator in, in Maryland, and that is Kevin Reagan, the, the theater teacher, our Little Mermaid director. Hold on a sec. Just and then um, I had announced previously in one of the other uh, spotlights about uh, Mr. Bell receiving the award in New York City, and this is him receiving that award. And those are the teachers that joined him at that national conference. I did it again. And this was an amazing day. So this was um, the recent Ag Day at the 4-H Club, uh, or 4-H Park. Um, I know Dr. Salins attended in the morning. I went the same day in the afternoon. And what we had um, was Stevensville and Mattapique went on the first day, and Sudlersville and Centerville went um, the second day. It was just very well organized. It was a great um, partnership with community. And uh, I want to just shout out to Michael Page because he um, worked very diligently to make this day come to fruition. So um, congrats to him. And I believe that's it. Thank you. Thank yep, you. You're welcome. We have our student board members. Right, would you like to start off? Um, yeah. So for Queen Anne's County High School, um, tomorrow's on April 7th, the FFA <coughs> will be having their annual banquet from 6 to 8 p.m. at our high school. Also, tomorrow there will be a National Art Society inductions of 65 students at 5 p.m. There was three different sessions because there, there was a great amount of students. Um, it's for juniors and seniors because seniors weren't allowed to have an induction because of coronavirus last year. Um, but this Friday, April 3rd, report cards will be sent home electronically for the end of the third marking period. April 12th, Queen Anne's County High School will have a college and career night in the cafeteria at 6 p.m. April 13th in the Media Center, um, you can get some help on information on dual enrollment for the Chesapeake College. And lastly, on April 26th, there will be an art scene in the cafeteria and lobby at 5 p.m. For Queen, at Queen Anne's County High School. There will be live demonstrations, live music, and plenty of artwork and displays to walk around and see. That night, they will also include the National, art, uh, National Arts Honor Society inductions. And we also have our prom at the end of this month, I believe, at, I believe yeah, just at the end of April month. Um, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone. So we're really just in the groove of things at Kent Island as we get closer to wrapping up the school year and our final quarter. Um, recently some of our students have started up a few new clubs that we're excited about, such as the Debate Club, Chess Club, and we restarted our chapter of SAD, which is short for Students Against Destructive Decisions in preparation for this year's prom, um, which is going to be May 21st. Uh, we are now fully into our spring sports season after a successful winter season with multiple state champions, as we mentioned before. Uh, we successfully administered the SAT to our juniors last month, and they can expect to receive those scores in the next couple of weeks. Additionally, we had a couple of exciting events that were previously mentioned, such as our prom expo, where Mr. and Mrs. Ken Island were selected, as well as our showings of The Little Mermaid. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Fabulous. OK, that ends that. We're going to go with next is our citizen participation. Thank you, Mr. Topper. Uh, speakers uh, should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to 30 minutes in length. Comments longer should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members or are not appropriate in public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. The first on our list is John Kent Kentle, Kentley. Can you just <laughs> give your name and address for the record? Be glad to, sir. John, last name is Kenty. 
Address is 104 Margaret Drive, Stevensville, Maryland, 21666. Just need to know when I can begin. I'll start. Okay. Feel free. I think I have three minutes. Am I correct in that, sir? Yes, sir. I'll, we'll start it again. Yep. Ready, set, go. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm John Kenty, a retired classroom teacher, coach, and administrator with 32 years of experience at the middle and high school levels. For the last four years, I've had volunteered at Mattapique Elementary School. I and so many other families in the county have a vested interest in the future of our schools. Nationally, Queen Anne County Public Schools are ranked in the top 25%. In Maryland, of the 497 public and private high schools rated, Queen Anne County rated 90th, placing them in the top 20%. The Queen Anne County private sector alone generates $1.7 billion in revenue. A recent article states that Queen Anne County is the right choice for a prime affordable location. It lists a well-educated workforce as one of the draws for businesses seeking to locate in Queen Anne County. If the county is to maintain its position as a magnet for economic growth, then the schools also need to maintain a quality education. Families with young children considering the quality of the schools as a prime factor in where they settle. Why then is the board proposing some untenable negotiating points for the upcoming teacher contract? For instance, raising health care costs with no step increase, cutting planning time, and insinuating that planning well, time. Let, let me just will say be, one thing: we can't. We're not here to discuss negotiations. We'll be, you can give us opinions, but I don't know. We, there's, there's two negotiating teams, and that's supposed to be held privately, and I can't speak to that or should anybody else at this table openly so any discussion of what is being done in other counties as far as contracts is also off the table if you could what other counties do it is i have no control over what i just want to make sure is our negotiating teams have confidentiality and it's done legally and it's not it's not a public it's not supposed to be done in a public forum from my understanding and I've then how do i present i'll be happy to how do i present what i have written to the board of education where it can be disseminated without uh how should we say the public presence you certainly can send it to us an email sir but you can discuss what other counties have done if that is part of your presentation it certainly is and please proceed thank you so very much i appreciate it sir let me continue then let's compare where contract negotiations are in other jurisdictions talbot county a 3.25 percent increase Harford County, a 7% increase. Talbot, Harford, and Cecil counties offer a step with no contract language changes or increase in health care costs. Wacomico, Worcester, Kent, and Caroline are still negotiating, but have no contractual language that produces a negative impact to their members. Kent, Wacomico, and Caroline counties are currently looking at offering steps as well as increases ranging from 3 to 7 percent. A master's degree is required to maintain certification. It can cost $30,000. Couple this with the cost of paying student loans and the cost of living, and one can see where teachers in Queen Anne County could lose ground to other jurisdictions when it comes to an equitable, fair contract. Teachers are going to find employment in a county where they can make a living. I strongly urge the citizens of Queen Anne's County to contact the Board of Education as well as the County Commission to express in the strongest possible terms the devastating impact of some of these proposals on the future of education in Queen Anne County. Not to act is to watch the dismantling of a school system that is recognized on the national and state level as one of the best. So ma'am, I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present that. Appreciate thank you, Mr. Kenny. The rest of the text will be sent to the board.
George, will you state your name and your address, please, for the record? Good evening. My name is Julie George, Julia George. I'm a school nurse. I live at 5459 Wellington Drive, Trap, Maryland. I have been a school nurse for Queen Anne's County since 1984. I have an RN licensure. I have my BSN. I'm nationally certified as a school nurse. School nurses are dedicated health professionals. We have worked under great stress and great pressure, often overwhelmed this school year. We have continued not only in all our regular school nurse duties, but we have been added uh, the responsibility of three other demanding jobs. We have turned into the COVID pandemic communicable disease nurse. We have helped with the safe reopening of our schools. We are the contact tracers for the Queen Anne's County school system and the COVID testers as well. We spent the entire first half of this school year under overwhelming, ever-increasing demands and pressures. These pressures did not occur for one nurse in one school for one day. It was every school, every nurse, every day. It wasn't for a few days. It was for weeks, days, and months. And just through when we were beginning to plow our way through, reduce, reducing reports of the need for contact tracing and positives, Omicron hit and it started all over again. And we're just now beginning to swim our way out of that. Meanwhile, everything that we should have done in September, October, and November is backlogged and waiting for us to do. I don't know if it will ever get done this year. We have standards we must meet. We performed as consummate health professionals because that's what we are. We are health care professionals. We should be recognized by Queen Anne's County School System as the professionals we are. We should be classified with our counterparts, the educators, in the certificated unit one. We should be in the same group with these professionals. Teachers have SPCs and APCs certificates or issued by MSDE. They too pursue masters and advanced educational degrees. They may choose to, to seek and, and be accredited in national board certifications. Nurses have licenses that are issued by the Maryland Board of Nursing. We must meet the standards of COMAR, the Nurse, Nurse Pac Practice Act, which tells us our scope of practice and how to maintain our standards. We have legal liability and requirements that we must maintain. We too have college degrees and bachelor's degrees. We have at least three nurses with master's degrees in our county. We have four nurses who have chosen to pursue their national certification. We have a certified pediatric nurse and several national certified school nurses. Thank you. I hope you will partner with us in helping us to be part of the certificated unit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. start your time but just give us your name and address for the record. My name is Coral Adams. I live at 402 South Church Street, Southersville, Maryland. Thank you. I am a stakeholder in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I've graduated from Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I have three students in Queen Anne's pa County Public Schools. I live here. I vote here. I'm a constituent and I'm a teacher. I feel like I need to state that first because I don't always feel like I'm heard as a constituent and a teacher. In fact, 85% of the teachers in your classrooms are constituents and teachers. So we vote in this county, we live in this county, and we send our kids to schools in this county. We are the most vested stakeholders in this district. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you who I am since you know where I'm coming, what, what my vested interest is. I've been teaching for 18 years. I have 60 graduate credits. That's the equivalent of two master's degrees. I'm nationally board certified. National board certified teachers, there are only 5% in the state of Maryland. There are, I believe, 21 in Queen Anne's County. That's less than 1%. So I feel pretty confident standing in saying that I am a I am, I am very well vested in my career. I, I know what I'm talking about. I'm an expert in my field, if you will. 
I stand above many other teachers in the building, in the county, and in classrooms in the level of commitment that I've put into my career and the education that I have. And I didn't get all of those degrees and I didn't get those advanced certifications because I expected to be a millionaire. Quite frankly, especially this year, I've looked into my value in other industries. After coronavirus, after um, virtual learning, the skills that I've gained are massively important in the public, in the private sector and the federal government sector. And what they're offering in terms of benefit packages and in terms of salary is exponential. And if anybody is confused to think that teachers get summer vacation and that's the perk, government employees get four to six weeks of vacation a year, especially once you're vested. So that's only two weeks off, so it's fine. I can still take my summer vacay, I can work in the federal government, my pay grows up, my pay goes up and I have a better benefits package than what I'm hearing is offered now. If so I'm not here for the money, but I am here for the respect. I feel that I deserve the respect. I feel that I've worked hard and I have been in the classroom every day, but I'm not getting it. And I say this to you because there is a massive uh, number of teachers that are leaving classrooms. That's happening nationwide, but that's happening in this county. This year, this county has functioned with, I'll give you exact numbers, I know the board likes that, with 44 open classroom positions for throughout the course of the school year that they have not been able to fill. There are 72 overall open positions in the county. This board has also sent out a survey to teachers in Queen Anne's County to ask them if they plan to return. Based on the number of emails that are in my email box, many, many, many do not plan to return. So my question to you all is, how do you plan to attract high quality, the best quality teachers, and how do you plan to retain teachers like me? Thank I don't know if I'm coming back next year. Thank You'll know in July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Crow. Did I say this correctly? Ty Crow. He's already gone. All right, thank you. Heather Lowe. No. Jimmy Greer. Green. No. Okay. Uh, Kent Lang. Kent Lang, 201 Tillman Neck Road, Centerville. So I come back to you again about a year later after being here with you last year, pretty much about the same topic, but we started out with finding out that most of what I was going to say we can't actually talk about. So to the um, people that do get to talk to the negotiating team, you do get to set forward what type of negotiations actually are going to be pushed. And if we want these people to be able to concentrate on our students, they can't be worried about paying the bills. This crowd would be much bigger tonight, but they're at their second jobs. True. That's right. not acceptable for our students. Not for just them, but for our students, because when they can't focus, when they are worried, when they're stressed, what are our students getting? And if we all agree that we want the best education for our students, we have to be doing better. You have to be doing better. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, anybody signed up. Is anybody in the public who would like to say anything? Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I just want to read a quote. Is that okay? Yes. Just give me your name and I know, but give me your name and address. <laughs> Stephanie Anthony. I live in Centerville, Maryland. Do you need my full address? Yes, please. Center. 137 Fairbrook Way. Fairbrook Way. Fairbrook Way, Centerville, Maryland. Thank you. It's in Northbrook with 90% of Centerville. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to share a quote. A person who feels appreciated will always do more than expected. And I hope that quote resonates with you all. A person who feels appreciated will always do more than expected. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anthony. Okay, that will be, I have nobody else that, okay, that should be the end of our uh, citizens' participation com public comment. Thank you all for speaking. 
sergeant. I'm sorry, that's clear. take about a five minute break right now and we'll be right back. Okay, thank you. Welcome back to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education. Our next uh, information item will be school safety. Sergeant Davidson. standing in for Lieutenant Meal tonight. He sent me with some information that he would like to pass on to you. I'll read it if I may. Please. Thank you. On behalf of Sheriff Hoffman, Lieutenant Meal, and the entire staff of Queen Anne's County Sheriff's Office, we thank you, Superintendent, Superintendent, and the Board of Education members for your continued support of our office and for providing our agency an opportunity to give brief updates for the Sheriff's Resource Unit and the Bus Patrol Program. Within the last several weeks, the D.A.R.E. program was initiated uh, within the Mattapique Middle School curriculum. It should be noted that feedback has been received from this program and thus far it has been very positive with both the students and the staff. This could not have been achieved without the support from superintendent and the Board of Ed staff. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Next, I'd like to discuss an update with the school bus camera enforcement program. The program is running efficiently, and over the past 60 days, our office has received 163 citations. 104 of those have been approved for violations, and 59 of them have been declined for various administrative reasons. This is a 63.8% approval rating. We continue to see instances where citizens are traveling near bus stops at high rates of speed, and we have taken the, the proper enforcement action on them. We ask that everyone please slow down and pay attention uh, and stop to permit our students to safely enter and exit the buses. Our office continues to provide and maintain a comprehensive security operations plan daily to ensure the safety and the welfare of all the students, faculty, and staff within Board of Ed properties. And we take these responsibilities very seriously. We are very fortunate to live, work, and play in one of the safest counties in the state of Maryland. In closing, again, thank you, Superintendent and the Board of Ed uh, board members for your continued support and cooperation with our staff. We appreciate you and the excellent working relationships that we have together. Uh, the only thing that I would like to add to Lieutenant Meal's uh, information is going back to those um, bus patrol uh, offenses. Uh, this time, uh, I know, I believe last time he probably mentioned that we had several repeat offenders. This time, we do not have any. So it's working. It's a good sign. It appears that drivers are beginning a little bit more to pay attention um, and slow down and stop for the lights. Uh, we've added several of our other SROs. At, at first, it was just um, several of us supervisors that were actually um, taking care of them. But now we've added several of the other SROs. SROs um, that are assisting, so things are moving a whole lot smoother than it was in the very beginning. Um, you guys know we had a little bit of hiccup, but uh, things are running very smoothly now. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much Thank you. for your time. Today. Question. Mm -hmm. When the camera goes, that's a ticket to the vehicle because it's tagged, but do you are you sometimes around if we see repeated ones that you actually give the driver a ticket to? So if, if we have a deputy that is in the area mm -hmm. um, and they actually take enforcement action on the offender, 
what we have done now in our office, I can't say for Centerville PD or for Maryland State Police. Um, it's a little bit more difficult. I know most of them understand that we are helping you guys with the program, but I haven't had any phone calls. That said, our deputies call me and say, hey, you know, I took offense on, or I took, took action on this offense. Here's the bus number, date and time. And then when they start rolling in, I can catch them. Um, obviously, it's a it's a it's a higher um, it's a higher violation offense if it's an on view with a law enforcement officer as it is coming from the company. Oh wow, nice. Hey, well, I'm glad to hear that we're not getting repeat. No, this, I, mean, I, I believe I mean, this is the is. first time. I don't, I, I'm not 100 percent sure how often you guys have, have received this. Right. I know it's been at least two or three times, mm -hmm. um, but I believe this is the first time that we haven't had a, a repeat offender. But that, so. that, like you said, agrees that it's it's working. Yes. I mean, we don't, we'd like to have zero, but. Correct, correct, we're yeah. working on it. <laughs> well, thank you. Any board members have any? No. Nope. no well, tell your you. staff and uh, Sheriff Hoffman and the ref, everybody, we appreciate what you do for us. We'll do. Yeah, thank you very it's much. A, it's thank a great you. partnership, and I think our parents and students need to know that it's a safe place to be in Queen Anne's County. I just wanted to add something. Sergeant Davidson has been a pleasure to work with. He is truly, you don't see him that often. He's the behind the scenes guy, but he is the nuts and bolts. I like bolts. it that way. No, he is the nuts and bolts um, that holds it together. And like I said, it, it, you couldn't ask for a better person in that position. And uh, just wanted to recognize you for that. I appreciate video, it. Thank so. you very much. Well, thank you for all you yeah. do. Thank, thank you. Okay, our next one is uh, <laughs> policy 505, second read. Matt. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salins, members of the board, executive team. For the record, my name is Matt Evans, Supervisor of Student Services. The first policy I have before you tonight is for the second read of the bullying, harassment, and intimidation policy. As of this morning, there had not been any comments after the posting. Okay. Has anybody got any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, it will be a motion to send it back out, or do we, we, just, we just send it? We just send it back out, don't we? Good deal, thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. okay. This is second read, correct? Second read. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. just send it. Thank you. This next policy before you is also on second read, and that is the pregnant and parenting students policy. Uh, that one as well has not received any comments since it was posted last month. Do we have a number on that, sir? There's not a number on that as of right now that I'm aware of. I had a couple questions on it, just because it, 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 the purpose, it just seems so um, vague. Um, so it says the, a range of specific activities and policies, but it said not limited to excused absences, makeup work. So we're saying that we're going to accommodate more than what we already have. Um, I know we're going to get our attendance data later. So there, how does that look like? I mean, are they getting a lot of extra time? Or are they just, I mean, I don't Yeah, know. so it, it, it does kind of expand and allows for opportunities where a, stu a semester may need to be extended for, for a student. Um, but particularly makeup work, allowances for absences, and also uh, the designated private lactation area. Okay. Um, and then it says designated support staff. Who Who is going to be designated support staff? The school nurse and pupil personnel workers. Really, the pupil personnel workers will assist um, potentially with delivery of work uh, to ensure that they are, if they're not able to come in the building, that they're able to keep up with their classes. Okay. And then it says the pregnant and parenting students must be allowed to participate in all aspects of the educational program, including all academic, physical, and social components. I'm not sure what that would look like. I mean, are, are we are we going to be the, that, that, that we're not eight, going to exclude them for? Well, I understand we're not going to exclude them. That's a little different than saying that we must um, allow to participate in all of it. So physical, how? I guess I don't know what that looks like, and it seems a little vague on the on the purpose. So again, it, it's it, it's basically they're entitled to all the same rights as as all the other students. Okay. And this, and this is something that's mandated by the state that we have to have this policy. Correct. So it's something that's been generated from the state to come down to fit Queen Correct. This was the model policy from MSDE. So I have to ask, since we don't have a policy number on it, are, is this going to be placed under student support or under instruction? Student services. Okay. Um, 
school health is under student services. Right. Okay. Because it's really bad instruction, though. It is, but I. Um, it, it seems to fit well there. Okay. To me. So when you bring it to us for a final approval, you will have a have a number on it. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Any other board member? Thank you. Oh, you're still here. <laughs> I am. So now, uh, so now I'm here to present attendance data. Uh, the purpose will be to define commonly used attendance terms and to understand the metrics used when we're analyzing student attendance and look at our last three years of attendance data as compared to what's happening this year. Um, one of the main terms that have been used year after year is average daily attendance or ADA, which is the total number of days of student attendance divided by the total number of days of student enrollment. So for example, if we're talking about one student who missed 10 days of school in a 180 day school year, it would be 170 divided by 180, which comes out to 90 4.4%. So when we're looking at the entire district, that's every student, uh, it's their, their days attended as a numerator and then days enrolled as the denominator, add all those together and that's how we get that metric. And we can also do it by, by school. Chronic absenteeism is when a student is absent 10% of the school year for any reason. Um, and that, that number is always fluid because a student may miss 10 days, or let's say eight days at the beginning of the year because they're very ill, but then ultimately has good attendance beyond that. And they might be considered chronically absent right up until January, February, until they've actually, you know, there's been enough days in the school year where they recover. Habitual truancy is when a student is unlawfully absent from school in excess of 20% of the year. And that, so that's where we are looking at. We know that there's not a good reason for the student that is, is not attending. It's an unlawful absence. And then finally, was a code that we used is new to us this year was MED, students excluded from school and counted as absent due to COVID-19 quarantine protocol. So starting first with our average daily attendance, uh, 2018-19, 94.4%. And again, that's you know, the average student is, is attending 170 out of 180 school days. 2019-20, uh, very much the same. And we've been steady pre-COVID um, around that 94% at the district level. 2021, you see it, it dropped 2%, 92.4%. Certainly that was you know, the, um, the year after the COVID shutdown began majority of the year we were not in the buildings but we were taking attendance as to um, digital attendance and virtual learning and then uh, currently as of March 7th it's it's down to 91.08 percent and again that number uh, will change by the end of the school year for chronic absenteeism uh, the 1819 school year 13.3 percent uh, went up 19 20 and of course that's when we closed and we, that attendance stopped at March 15th I think in 2020 was when we shut down the schools last year it was up to 21.3 percent and again that's there was a lot of uh, virtual learning attendance or distance learning that we were taking this school year as of March 7th it's 32 percent and again that number um, you know will still be fluid throughout the year what, what I mean that's all pre-COVID we're down into the mid-teens and now all of a sudden we're 32 is it mainly so, so this next slide is 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 an interesting piece okay. of data but oh, I'm sorry the, the one after this we'll get through habitual truant but I will answer that question um as you see, 18, 19, 42, we had 42 habitual truant students. Again, these are students that are unlawfully absent 20% or more of the school year. 19, 20, we had 44 students. Last year, during distance learning, we had 610. Uh, that data is provided to us by MSDE in July of every year. Now, this slide here, and this really, it doesn't speak to all of it, but it speaks to a lot. So you heard me mention the, the MED code uh, for students who are excluded from school due to COVID-19 quarantine protocols. So when we pulled this data, this was any student who had gotten at least one of those MED codes as an absence code. So we had 3,282 students this school year that we told them they could not come to school due to either they were a close contact or they were positive for COVID. That's what's got that. Number. So that's 40 5% of the student population right there. And that ultimately um, 
Yeah, it's had a significant impact on our attendance. So, so when a student sent to lunch table and it's close contact, they're out for how many days? That that gets they're they're out for chronic. Correct. And and if you remember at the beginning of this, we were quarantining close contacts for 14 days. And then right. as the Department of Health was given this different guidance, it decreased. But there was a point we were quarantining close contacts for 14 days. So that's two weeks of schools, typically 10, 10 absences. Right there, you're very close to being chronic absent, chronically absent for the year. And I mean, it's, it's, it's passed. But when there, wait, the percentage of people that tested positive that were out for close contact were very less low, wasn't 2%. it? Less than 2%. Yeah. So we're, we're putting people like, uh, people, students, having to quarantine for that length of time with only two, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's something we should, if this ever goes on again, it's yeah. something we should learn from the past. Agreed. And I would also just like to point out that there's a real inequity between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. We caused a real learning loss, even more so in students who were not vaccinated, who had to quarantine longer, even and then even though their percentage also um, was as low, if not lower. And so that's, I think that's something there, that Yes, there were different stress. quarantine times, yeah. that's correct. But I also think that we need to recognize that these were th these were rules, although ever changing, that were dictated by the CDC that was supported through MSDE. And that's what we go by. We go mm -hmm. by, you know, the direction of MSDE. Um, and so you have your state um, health department, working with your local health department, providing us those recommendations. So um, I, I do understand, obviously, that we had some students up to 14 days, then 10 days, then five days. But at the time during the pandemic, when that was requested for them to do so, we were following the rules of CDC right. and Correct. Maryland State Department of Health. I mean, was that a local they, board's control? Yes. I, I mean, well, not always. The, it was once. It wasn't always. The recommendations were just that recommendations. Now, once MSD. Endorsed, in endorsed and and and, and then we made their regula emergency regulation then yes but but I mean I I'm just I'm just I'm just putting it out there that I think we have to be very cognizant of, of this inequity in another way um, between uh, what we perceive as a um, more of a risk from kids who post no additional risk the other piece too is we made a big point of saying if you are sick do not come to school mm -hmm. if you have symptoms mm -hmm. do not come to school even if they were not coded as med parents knew not to send the students and you know with allergies and colds there's a lot of things that go around that sure. you know when you say sick that that's a loose term you know and uh, so my last slide, the conclusion, obviously COVID-19 shutdowns and quarantine protocols, as we discussed, have had a significant impact on student attendance. Uh, our office student services, we continue to certainly this year prioritize habitual truancy, where we know there's not a good reason for the student's poor attendance, that it is unlawful, and student engagement for the school year. Um, attendance throughout the, the, the state and the nation is, is a pretty dismal for the school year. Hey Matt, on that habitual tr uh, truant students, the increase was pretty dramatic in 2021 during virtual learning, I understand that. Um, but for 2021-22, the data is provided by the uh, State Department of Education in July. Do we give it to them? Yeah, so ultimately our local accountability office sends our attendance data which has a number of unlawful absences. And do we have like an indicator of what it is right now? I do not right now. Can they provide that to us? Correct. Just to get a It's sense. It's not a report that we're running right now um, that is provided to us by MSD. I mean, can the local office that's calculating this give us an indication in the meantime, instead of waiting until July? Actually, Ms. Kenna's here, so she's <laughs> oh, yes. if we're gonna let her speak to her, she's okay. the one who does the reporting, so I'm kinda gonna defer to her. To, I, I don't have it tonight, but you can. Give us a ballpark of what we think it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Cow. Right. Other Thank questions? You, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Go Tigers. Hey, State Board of View. This is Kenna. All right. So I don't. All right, 
So good evening, everybody. President Smith and Dr. Salins and Board of Education and all the exec team. So I am here today to talk to you guys about the State Board data review um, a couple weeks ago, or it might have been last Tuesday. Time seems to be flying. The state um, MSDE uploaded a lot of data onto the Maryland Report Card. So Maryland MarylandReportCard.org. So I took a moment just to just wanted to come meet with you and break this down to for our system because they're talking about a state level. So the purpose, we are going to review the data shared with MSDE, um, sorry, with the Maryland State Board of Education as it applies to our school. So we're gonna be talking about cohort graduation, dropout rates, SAT data, advanced placement data, post-secondary enrollment data, and our early fall MCAT data. So good news. Our four-year cohort graduation trends um, have not been terribly negatively affected by COVID. We have done a really good job of maintaining over a 96% graduation rate, COVID or no COVID. And I really do like the maps. I've taken these right from MSD, but look, the dark blue on the Eastern shore, that shows that we have higher than a 95% graduation rate and we have historically. So we are holding where we have been. If you can see the state's graduation rate is at 87.2% from last year and we're up over 95%. The flip side of that is the four-year cohort dropout rate trends. We have experienced a little bit of, an, of a uh, increase in dropout, as you can see in 2020 for the district. We did lose a few more students um, because of the COVID, but again, still far below the state um, and we're doing pretty well. At this point, this, this year as we stand right now, we currently have 15 students, not that have dropped out this year, it doesn't work that way, but since they started as freshmen. So our four-year dropout rate at this point would be 15 students. So when we're talking about such small numbers in a small system, um, each student seems to have a pretty good impact on our overall numbers. But again, when compared to the rest of the state, we're doing very well. We are the three, we are one of the three light blue counties, I'm sorry, four light blue counties. So we have less than 3% of our students uh, actually dropping out. So, and far better than the state average of 7.4%. Our college readiness trends, according to MSD, we are going to assess these based on SATs and advanced placement tests. So our SAT numbers um, have been doing pretty consistently over the years, COVID or not COVID. I want to take a minute just to take a look at the 2020 graduating class. They have a bump of 577 students tested. Those were the first students who took our school day SAT as juniors. The 2021 graduates also had the opportunity to take the school day SAT, but we were virtual at the time. Mm. They came into school to do it. So that was, we were really asking a lot of those students. So we did not have the turnout for the school day SAT as we would have had as, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, as we would have had if the kids had been in school. So, so the 2021 graduates uh, did take the SATs, yes. We did give them the school day SAT, yes. But we did see an overall decrease in the number of students taking the SAT. Maryland saw a huge decline, 32% decline in SAT participation. At this point, 67% of our current seniors have taken the SAT. Uh, and we did just give the SAT school day to all of our juniors. So we are getting back on track there. Can I ask a quick question? Do we think that part of those numbers are because, because of COVID, a lot of schools were not requiring SAT scores? Yeah, we um, have gone to, I believe so, yes, that okay. we've gone to a lot of test optional schools. Um, and I know just dealing at the high school for the past 12 years is the dean, that was a major, a major uh, motivation to apply to a school versus not. Yeah. So many students were only applying to test optional schools and they saw no reason to take the SAT. And 
Is there also, was there any ACT testing sites? Because I know a lot of the Southern schools will take ACT over SAT. We are not an ACT testing district, but we do have some students that take the ACTs, yes. It's not a lot of students. Um, and we tend to counsel them more individually. So students that tend to do pretty well in math and science, and they didn't really like their SAT score, we may counsel them to take the ACT, but they tend to go to another district to do so. Advanced placement. Um, overall, the number of students testing for advanced placement is really just, you know, it's it's high higher some years than other years, and I can't necessarily tie that to uh, the COVID closures. If you do look at the 2020 school year, we tested 949 exams, 308 students. Those AP exams were all virtual. So they did those from home and a 73% pass rate that, that seemed to work out for our students. Last year we had a mix of some in-person paper testing and some uh, online testing. So we were back to 644 tests administered last year, 234 students, so less than 2020. Again, the 1920 closure and then the 2020 year of virtual learning did have some of our children shying away from taking these AP exams. So handling AP coursework during virtual learning was difficult for some of our students. Currently, we have 538 students enrolled in an AP course, and we have already ordered 761 exams. So, right back up. I can hear Mr. Smith in my head, so let me mention dual enrollment. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we currently have 129 students enrolled in dual enrollment. That's about a quarter of our graduating class. So. They may not be taking an AP course, but they are certainly engaging with college level material. Which brings us to post-secondary. What are our students doing after they graduate from high school? Um, in Maryland, 60% of these students enroll in a, some sort of post-secondary education. So that could be a two-year or four-year school within 12 months. We're doing better than that at 66% of our students. Um, and we've held pretty steady in the mid-60s range for years, and that's been over the state average. The class of 2021 did see a decline, so when we're looking at this map next year, you will see a bit of a decline. But I will say, again, from being there last year, being at one of the high schools last year, it was a very interesting group of students who graduated last year. They really took advantage of the time that they had. I had a number of seniors last year start their own businesses. A number of students were simply just working a number of students went to full dual enrollment and then they went and took whatever they had learned and went to work uh, many of our students like our CNA GNA students went and they were actually utilizing their their certifications in nursing and cosmetology and automotive so I think last year was was a bit of an interesting group of students and they many of them really took advantage of the time virtual learning gave them and then they were kind of saying well what else is different what else is unique do I have to go to a four-year school right after college? So we may see some of those students go to a four-year school. They just didn't necessarily do it within 12 months. Well, Scott, we're not tracking students who go on to do internships or apprenticeships or trades. After high school? Yeah. So, so this, 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 this will just... not track trades, but I've started um, researching a couple different tools to see if I can track that. Um, a lot of that's going to be self-reported, so it's more difficult for us to get our hands on it. But what comes from the state is going to be truly coming through the National Clearinghouse. Where have these students enrolled in either an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree? But I'm, I'm interested in that too, because I'd like to see where they go. Real quickly, can you track them through Naviance? Mm -hmm. So we, uh, Naviance has something called an alumni tracker. Right. So I have been playing around with that lately. It is fascinating. So I can tell you who, who from the class of 2016 graduated with what degree from which school. So if they know 2017. Uh, currently our class of 2022, hard to imagine, 50% of that our current seniors have already <coughs> applied to college. Okay, MCAT data. 
our testing data. So quick refresher, in the 1920 school year, this was supposed to be our first administration of MCAP, the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. This is going to be a new, new round of tests from MSD and Pearson. In 1920, because of the COVID closure, those tests were waived, so our students did not take them. We did have a small group of um, high school students take tests in January, take the MCAP in January, but it was a small group of students. In 2021, because of the COVID closure, we did not do any testing. In late summer, early fall, the state superintendent did request from the federal government if we could have a waiver for those tests and can we just waive all this all together, uh, and that was denied. So MSD and Pearson, the testing company, got together and they created shortened versions of these MCAP assessments for us to give in early fall. So what that meant was, was that students in grades four through 11 took an assessment the third week of school of the previous year's coursework. Um, they were less than half the length of the what will now be the usual MCAT score. And the point was to see how much they had retained or learned and then retained during the COVID closure. Assessments were scored rapidly on a three point scale and it was really just a simple percentage because they were trying to get us some scores. They did not have time to do range finding. They did not have time to set any scales. So the first administration of MCAT was really a mini MCAT. The students were told this is a participation grade, or participation test, sorry, not a grade. So they, you know, this is not hanging over their head as a graduation requirement, they just had to try. They just had to take it. <coughs> so in the, the state presentation the other week, I think that they may be saying that these are, these scores are a new baseline and that we're gonna show growth from there. As we have discussed in this room before tonight, we do not necessarily want our early fall scores to be our baseline. We would like to come up with a nice balanced approach, take a look at what we were doing in the 18-19 school year, and then use some of this data as supplementary material. So that said, our ELA early fall data, our elementary students, about 27% of them were proficient on their ELA test. The state was 24% proficient, so better than the state. Our middle schoolers did pretty well, 40% of them proficient, again, in the previous year's work higher than the state. Our 10th grade ELA, 47% proficient, uh, less than the state proficiency of 57%. The state overall saw, saw a 13% de decrease in their test scores from 2019 to now, but please remember that the 2019 scores were PARC scores. That was a different test as compared to this mini MCAP. Our scores also were much lower than they were in 2019. Again, different tests, but just as a couple points of comparison. Our elementary students, 55% proficient on the PARC back in 2019. Our middle schoolers, 63% proficient back in 2019 and our English 10, 73% proficient. So 73% versus 47%, I think we, we need to find a nice balance there. Ms. Kenneth, for yes, our, our people at home that don't know what ELA means. Oh, English language arts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harper, sorry. And I, I think the one thing we have to make, you know, COVID set everybody back. Mm -hmm. And parents, with all the stuff we're doing, with, and I know we're going to see some stuff later on, for summer schools and tutoring and stuff, all I can say is keep an eye and let's really push it because they need to get that in elementary school and get up to speed. It's, Everybody does. but You I mean, have to build those foundations. You have exactly. to build it. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's no fault of anybody's. It happened. And, and you know, we did what we could, but I think these kids are, su are suffering mm -hmm. and we need to take advantage of what's being offered today. And this data is from the third week of school. So we are now well past our 100th day mark. Math, elementary students 22% proficient in their math test. Middle school students uh, almost 12% proficient, both higher than the state. Our algebra one students 2.3% proficient, less than the state, 7% proficient. Um, I am a huge fan of our teenagers in Queen Anne's County. I do kind of think if they knew they didn't have to pass this math test, maybe they didn't really give it their all. Um, because traditionally we have done better than that. Our 2019 high school park data showed 64% proficient. So 64% to 2%. 
um, I believe they just weren't giving giving it their all. They needed to participate. They knew that they participated. The state also did see a decrease of 18%. So some more recent data. 92% uh, of the early fall English language arts assessed students have already earned their English 3 credit. So those students are current juniors, currently sitting in English 3. They were taking an English 2 test when they really needed to, when, when graduation was on the line, 92% of them turned right around, passed the English 3 course. 86% of them passed the English 3 final exam. Uh, they're, they're doing fine. 90% of our current sophomores in English 10 have already earned their credit for the course. The fall semester students took their English 10 MCAP, the full MCAP, not the mini. They took it in January. The spring semester students will take it in May. Those scores will not be available, though, until January of 2023. That is not a typo. They, uh, Why? Pearson I mean, needs time That's to, how long it takes to... Right. To actually make sure the test is ready to go. That's why the early that's why the early fall results were so interesting. So they have to do the range finding and all that's gonna take them some time to do it. On the math side, 86% of the early fall algebra testers have already earned their geometry credit. That's a 6% increase from where we were last year. So already doing better there. Again, the current freshmen, 80% of them are already passing algebra. They're, most of them are in a year long algebra course. They will be taking the algebra one MCAP in May. And again, those scores will be available in January. So this spring, we're gonna see some eighth grade social studies assessments, the government HSA, MISA for fifth and eighth grade has already occurred. The high school MISA is going to occur and then we're going to do the ELA and the math in grades three through 10. So what are we doing to address the data um, daily? The teachers are utilizing purposeful small group instruction and flexible grouping at least two to three times a week. Our elementary teachers are doing this daily. So, but at this point, the expectation is two to three times a week for everyone to offer directed support strategies to help build mathematical reasoning skills and reading skills. That's an individualized student approach to make sure that we're addressing the students where they are and then building upon that. Also daily ELA teachers are mitigating learning loss by engaging students in active reading, critical thinking, and effective reading practices to assist the students in cementing those skills that are assessed on the state test, but more importantly, like Mr. Smith was saying, to make sure we actually build a foundation for continuing study in ELA. Weekly, we have already offered over 11,000 tutoring sessions. We're doing this with ESSER funding. These are identified students who have suffered learning loss or are currently struggling, and they're attending tutoring either before, during, or after school. And then annually, we will be offering summer school programs as we did last summer to address learning loss and or provide enrichment. And Mr. Kintop will be able to explain more about that. So a data dump from the state to us. All of this is on MarylandReportCard.org. And if you need any other data, please let me know and I'll take it up for you. Does the board have any questions or? Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Mr. Kid up. Brought back up with you. Always. <laughs> um, it's like the A team's in here. <laughs> and me. Uh, uh, greetings, President Smith, Dr. Salins, board members, and executive team. Uh, I'm Kevin Kintop, the program director for Rise Academy, the alternative high school program. Joining me tonight are Amy Smith, the supervisor of the K-12 mathematics program and gifted and talented, Michelle McNeil, the supervisor of early learning, Title I, Title III in the migrant program, and Jolene Smith, the supervisor of special education. The reason that we're all here is because we are all collaboratively working to put together uh, an integrated summer program this year. Um, and I'd rather have the experts answering questions and giving you details about their programs rather than me trying to fumble my way through it. Okay. So tonight, our purpose is to provide you with an overview of the various 2022 summer learning programs that we're going to be offering. We're going to give you times, dates, locations of each of those programs, and we're going to talk about the number of staff now that are involved in both the planning and the, and the delivering of these programs this summer. 
first program I'll speak on is the pre-K to eight enrichment program, and that is what we did last year. That is the big one that we ran last year. Um, in there, we're gonna have six sites this year, Southersville Elementary School, Churchill Elementary School, Southersville Middle, Graysonville Elementary, Mattapeak Middle School, and Queen Anne's County High School. There are two changes from last year. One is we didn't have one at Southersville Middle School last year. Um, we are reinstating that one. Last year, we had an eight-week program, and we weren't able to find enough staff. So we had collapsed that site to help with our staffing. And then the Mattapeak site is being used this summer because Ken Allen High School is going to be having a lot of work done, and we're not going to have access to the, the areas that we had last year. We are going to run a four-week program this year. Instead of two sessions, we're going to have one session from July 11th to August 4th. We found last year that hiring staff for two sessions and really getting enough students in both those sessions, if we condensed it, we can really hit the same number of students and give a quality program. We'll run Monday through Thursday from 9 to 12, where half the time will be dedicated towards reading and half the time will be dedicated towards math. We will use pre and post evaluations to see the progress that students make during the program. All the curriculum and materials are going to be boxed and prepared for the teachers and ready to go. Um, we learned a lot of lessons last year. We already have training set up for the teachers, so they're going to get in probably three weeks before the program and set up the rooms and have everything ready to go before um, the end of June. Because this is our uh, attempt to target skill growth and close some of those gaps for the students that need this, uh, we are keeping our student numbers in the classroom still down between 12 and 15 because that allows the effective instruction. So with those numbers, we will, we're will we predicting that we could hit close to 700 students through these programs in just this grade level for this one. So the summer camps this summer, I'm so excited about. This is being paid through the Gears 2 grant that um, Mr. Michael Page and I had worked on last year and we were awarded through um, the state department and they will have four different sites so four of the six sites that we're using for summer enrichment will also have the summer camps during that same time the camps are first targeted to some of our GT students so they have been um, offered an application and a hand flyer once we look through and get all of our students that have applied if they're still opening then we'll open it up for any other students who may want to jump into those camps these camps have the um, STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, art and nature, drama and dance, and team sports. And so at most of the sites, all four camps are running. At the Graysonville site, we are only going to have the art and nature and the STEAM because those students, since there's only a couple grade there, we don't have the middle school, we're going to move those grades three and five over to the high school, or over to Mattapeak Middle School for the drama camp and the team sports so that those students have an opportunity to have an actual group, larger group of students. Those campsites will run between 18 to 20 students depending on our applications and enrollment process. So that will give us an additional 250 students that we'll be able to serve through programs. So the Migrant Program is a program that's run every summer. Um, it's a little bit more extended to the summer camps and um, the enrichment camps. So this camp um, program runs July 5th through August 12th. We are um, having it at Sellersville Elementary School this year. It was at Centerville Elementary School last year, and we felt that a lot of our students had a very long bus ride. Um, so we wanted to move it closer to um, where we are picking up our families. It is full day and it's run Monday through Friday. So with the four days and um, only half day for all the other camps, this is a full day. We have usually approximately 80 students and we serve from infants to 11th grade and we also open up to our year one immigrants. Um, Transportation is provided and the funding for this is through Title I Part C and our immigrant grant. Our focus, um, very similar to the camps that are being offered, the additional part is that English language acquisition to support our students and then we also ha have three family engagement workshop nights that we include in our program so the 
last one is another one that is not a new program. Um, it's extended school year, and this is uh, driven through the IEP process. Uh, so students that participate in the extended school year programs are qualified or eligible based on the, the IEP team and based on their unique and individual needs. Um, it's intended to maintain those skills for students that um, have kind of that longer recoupment time after the, the summer months where they're not attending schools um, or for those students that are dependent on that consistent routine in order to maintain those behavioral expectations from start to finish. Um, the locations are, are listed there and we mirror those uh, that are provided through the enrichment program. Uh, last year we shifted a little bit because we offered our ESY in conjunction with the enrichment program and we will continue to do that this year as well. So we do have the opportunity to provide itinerant, small group, or inclusive service delivery models. Um, so it, it, it has made for um, additional less restrictive options as well. It also runs four weeks um, and then our funding source is through special education, local, and grant funding. Are these full day? They're not. They again. They mirror. Okay. So they, the time it, frame and everything. It's it's specific to the individual, so it depends on the student themselves and and what is needed as per the IEP. And as I recall, there was no transportation provided with that either. There is, if they have transportation on their IEP as a related service. Thank you. And if they're part of the already enrichment program, then there is transportation that they, they can use with that. So, yeah, that was definitely one of the nice things about having that enrichment program is we were kind of able to, you know, we have a lot of parents that elected to participate in that enrichment program that often in years past have not taken advantage of the ESY services because it was an extra step or an extra, you know, time out of their day. The students are already there, so we were able to capture them and really hone in on some of those gaps that the students really needed that extra support with. That's great, thank you. So while all of this is going on for pre-K to A, we also have our high school credit recovery program that'll be going on uh, Queen Anne's County High School. It's for grades nine through 12. And I will put a caveat, even grade eight, because there are some eighth graders who are taking high school courses. So if they need to recover a credit from that, they can they can be part of this. Um, it is gonna run the same four weeks from July 11th, August 4th, Monday through Thursday. But there are two sessions each day. Each course is for two hours and 45 minutes. There's a 15 minute break. So we start at 8 a.m., we end at 1.45. Students can sign up for one or two courses. Um, we are doing recovery in the English, math, science, social studies, and select elective courses. And it really does um, come on what students need. So we kind of make those decisions based on when we see them. Uh, we use a blended learning model in summer school. That means it is not completely online. One day out of each week, the teachers are actually teaching a live lesson in the online program that the kids, and so the students are requested to be in attendance on those days. So a quarter of their instruction is actually live with the teacher. And they're getting that instruction. They can come all four days and the teacher's gonna provide them support and help what they need. But there's a directed lesson in biology on Mondays, chemistry on Tuesdays, and so forth. So the science teacher is providing live lessons in that program. So that'll be running simultaneously at Queen Anne's County High School. The big piece of summer programming is the amount of collaboration that goes into making this work. So far in just planning, we've had the curriculum supervisors, principals, food service department, transportation, human resources, finance, the executive team, and a number of school staff just helping us build the structure, get information out there, and design things increases tenfold when we go to put it in play because then we're going to add on our custodians, Sodexo, teachers, paraprofessionals, nurses, bus drivers, and school secretaries to make this work throughout the summer. We have to move furniture. We have to provide meals. We have to make sure kids get home, get to the programs. We have nurses at every location if, in case there's any issues. So there are a lot of people who are involved in this and we're absolutely grateful um, for everybody who has volunteered. Uh, I will say at this point, We've had, we're gonna have a meeting on Monday, uh, the 11th. We've had 150 applications so far from staff to fill positions this summer. So that has been um, good for us. We're, we're, we call it our little fantasy football draft, our fantasy teacher draft next Monday where we each for our programs try to match up the right people in the right places. Um, 
in conclusion, uh, we are trying this year to run multiple opportunities simultaneously. Um, with the addition of the camps, now we're able to provide what we look at as being able to work with over 1,200 students potentially. Um, we are meeting a diverse need from those that need to build that gap, close that gap, build some structure to the GTs, to helping high school students prepare to be a graduate with their cohort by coming to summer school. Um, we are sharing sites with all of these programs, and I'm very grateful to the schools for allowing us to bring these multiple programs into their buildings, but that allows us to be more efficient with transportation, with food service and all that. We don't have to staff as many places then for those types of things. Um, and honestly, I can't think of a department in the system right now that is not in one way or another impacted by these programs, and we're just we're grateful for all of that. So in, involving everybody is gonna make it run smoother. Are there any questions? So the food service is also being paid out of ESSER or GEARS? It is gonna be paid out of um, ESSER 3. Okay, and so far we have enough money left to help. I mean, this is a grand undertaking, so we're, we're, we're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll report on ESSER next. Kind of Thank next. you. <laughs> when we recruit teachers and support staff, there are Yes. employees that will get the option first. Yes. So they'll be first to get that option if they would like to do this. An, in, an internal invite went out to all of our current staff to fill out a form. They could tell us where they work, what they were interested in doing this summer, what positions they would be interested in. We're going to go through them, and if we have holes or openings, then we open it out beyond our, our staff. So, but, but, but initially, you could go to our staff. They get to look at it. Yes. Uh, work with them as much as we can yes. as far as what holes we fill up, and then if we can't fill internally, then we would look to go outside. Yes. Have and we, we had a lot that came last year from out of the county to be supportive, um, and they've reached out already. <laughs> Some of them yeah, didn't but, get but, the form, but, but they've reached but, but out and said we'd like to come yeah, back. My, and I, I, I appreciate that, but my first concern would be if, you know, we have staff that wants to do it that's been there in our system, uh, I'm going to look at them first. If they don't want to do it and opt out to do it, I completely understand it's their time too. Absolutely. Uh, then we, you know, fill other people, other holes. 100% we'd rather have our staff because they're familiar with the curriculum. They're familiar with a lot of the things that are already doing. So it, it makes much more sense for the kids for us to have our current staff. Have you received a lot of responses? We have right now 150 mm -hmm. that have responded to that call for positions. So um, we've really, in summer programming before, never had to do a whole lot of like interviewing and things because it was like, okay, we got enough people to fill this. Good, we got enough people. Um, I'm already noticing a couple of the positions we're going to have to do some um, selection and interviewing because we have more people for positions than we have positions. That's, that's a when good he was problem. saying he had volunteers, you meant that you that was just the term. It's, they're not volunteering their time. <laughs> So they're getting paid. I, well, no, I understand that, but I didn't want someone to be watching and misunderstand that these are, they're getting paid. For oh, yeah, it's their it's paid positions. But we've had all these volunteers, like, well. No, okay. but, it, but to run all these programs and all these sites, it's a lot of the people that have to yes. be willing to work for that time. So we're grateful for that. And, I, and you know, it's, it's a great program, and I think parents and students need to be aware of it and take advantage of it. I mean, it's, you know. Well, you guys did a great lab, and it's wonderful that you were able to do the after action and, and come up with all these new ideas for this year, so it should be really great. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Well done. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Towers. Dr. Salins, President Smith, board members, executive team. My name is Jane Towers and I work in the finance department. Tonight we bring before you ESSER 2 and 3 grants for your review. We are working on amendments for ESSER 2. And the reason being is we want to incorporate iReady screener and diagnostic and with some savings that we can recognize as well as moving some COVID supplies to a reopening grant. So you can see on the right-hand column, that's the work that we're doing as far as the amendments go. And Ms. Harper, to your question about the food service, I did follow up with um, operations department too because last year, I believe it was 100% paid, so we're gonna see what type of allocation the state is gonna make for the food service program too as well. Thank you. And the next one under ESSER 3, as you know, with um, there's changing needs as far as 
what is identified as um, needed supports in the district. So under the initial ESSER 3 proposal, it was for two summer school sessions. Now it's down to one. So it frees up some funds and these funds will be for to provide the Chromebooks for fifth grade under the amendment number one that we're working on. Two social workers are gonna come out of this and move to local and we're gonna incorporate at least four EL teachers over the next couple of years. Questions? Yeah, and then the budget takes up for the available budget. Um, and we're gonna, like, I'm just like in the first line, there's bus support and available. We were at a negative 44,000, but we have an amended amount of 123. Does that cover for that? Right, it does. So you're absolutely right. That first column under amendment one is going to be the increase, and then there's your adjusted budget going gotcha. forward on the right. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. The next item that we bring before you tonight is the detailed expenditure and summary report for period ending March 31st. This time of year, it's the closeout where we have expenditures that um, the deadline to spend the MOI is April 15th. So you'll see some encumbrances that will come off. So there's a couple negatives in here that we're anticipating will be um, offset by the encumbrance, the PO being closed. When you say that, I'm looking at 08 student health services. We're in, we're at 100% now. Is we, are we already there or that's a... Right, we'll take a look at that after the spending window is closed April 15th and then assess if there's any um, budget amendments that I need to bring before you for approval to get that into the positive. Well, same it's, thing with students' transportation too, but we always have that problem every year. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and um, Mr. Pender and I are gonna meet and talk about that and look at the allocations and, and see where we are as far as the, that budget amount going forward. We're kind of low too on the textbooks and the instructional costs. Is that because are we we're not taking that into summer school? So are we going to think we'll be realizing some savings from those? Uh, correct. And that's we, under category four. So this is um, this is the materials of supplies that the schools have their allocation. So up until April fifteenth, they have to to spend out anything would be rolled over into fund balance. How's our energy doing? Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's not good everywhere else. Are, are we, I mean, we, we use a lot of electricity, run our schools, we well, have fuel in our buses. and So for heating oil, we just uh, met our 80,000 gallons that we had purchased. That was uh, pre-purchased or something? Yes. Like that. that was locked in? Yes. So um, as far as heating oil, I think we're in a good situation because we're getting ready to come out of the boiler season and uh, our tanks are, I'd probably say at about 75%. So I'm, I'm pretty confident with that. I'll take a look at propane. We haven't finished off that portion. Um, I will say that our usage, because we were running the buildings two hours before, two hours after, you can look at that and see that's gone up out of 15, probably 20% based off of last year. But it's hard to look at the numbers from last year because really the buildings weren't active. So, um, and you can also look at the amount of fresh air that we're pulling in to, you know, recool or heat that air again. But um, I, I was looking we got at a hand, We got a handle on it. We're yes, not, sir. Uh, yes. We're not. No. It's not. I mean, I can just imagine, you know, have a circuit that air all winter and all these things that we're required to do. Hey, it's up after a while and energy's not getting any cheaper. Oh, you're correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Salem, school calendar possible modifications. Yes. Um, so uh, as the board knows that you approved five half days um, for staff members, and we had one of those days. Um, unfortunately, we had fog that came in. The fog was very, very heavy. There was no other decision but for safety purposes to make sure that our students got to school safely was that we had to push it and make it a 90-minute delay. And with that, there's no way possible 
possible to really have, um, in the best interest of students, possible to have um, abbreviated day. So um, students and staff had to be in session for a full day on a 90 minute um, delay. Uh, so with that being said, I come before you to offer um, a date of which um, we can make that day up if the board chooses to do so. I met with the different departments, um, instructionally spoke with Amy and also met with Matt's department specifically because this is the heightened of our testing time. Um, there's not a day really that there's available because we're testing every single day. So we tried to pick a day, which we did, May 13th, um, this, that's a Friday, where we have seven students who are engaged in an AP course that we feel that we can accommodate their needs on a half day schedule or abbreviated day schedule. And then we have a government test that does impact quite a number of students, but we have the ability to shift that at this time. Um, we have time to do that, to, to move that to a different day. So that would be the only day that I could recommend to the board um, to make up that day for, for staff and students uh, would be the May 13th day. Every other day that we look, the combination just wouldn't work out. I mean, and we're not just dealing with high school assessments, we're dealing with middle school assessments, we're dealing with elementary assessments. So it really impacts all the schools. Um, except for our real littles. So um, so that's the recommendation that I have would be May 13th, and that's something that would be modifying the schedule, which would need a board approval and vote. I got any comments? In my, my personal opinion, I'm not a big fan of half days to start with. We put five in our, we changed our calendar already once for five. Um, one didn't make it because of fog, which, 110% behind safety of the children and it was beyond our ability to do that. Um, the change is scheduled again for one half day. I think kids better off being in school. And I think parents have issues with schedules. I think everybody does. We, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get all five of them. We're gonna, it looks like we're gonna get four of them. But my, my personal opinion would be we leave the schedule as, as it's been uh, proposed. Or, you know, just, we've changed it once. Other board members? The five that we gave them, it's only for this year, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not a reoccurring. No. I need, I need either discussion or a motion to... Uh, Ms. Bennett, what do you think? Hmm? What do you think? I'm just gonna say anything. I kind of agree with you, and it's only, you know, four weeks out. It's not much notice for everybody. I'd like to do is if I hear a motion uh, and a second, then we can uh, take action on it. If I don't, it could die. I hear a motion. Dr. Sellins, I would think the board will not, uh, we just soon keep the calendar the way it is. is that okay. Understand. Um, I do have one more item under modification for um, the school calendar. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we have missed a total of six school days due to inclement weather. We had three that were built into our calendar. We made up two um, per uh, the state, uh, you know, uh, afforded us the opportunity to do that. So we still have one day that we haven't made up. And I would like, um, I would recommend to the board that we send a letter um, to request a waiver of the 180 day rule to um, have us only in session for 179 days. And, and just for your edification, we have more than met our hour requirement. So it's not as if we're, you know what I mean? We, we, we're well within the hour requirement, but you have to have 180 day seat time. And so this would be a, a request for a waiver to that 180 day rule. That would be my recommendation. And I'm prepared this evening with a letter for Mr. Smith. If you so choose that direction, we can sign it and get it to the state for tomorrow. I make a motion. Second. All those in favor to send to uh, reduce our school year for one day. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Go we'll send it. Thank you. Thank you. As soon as we get that back from the state, then we can set the last day of school. Okay. So you may have people asking you, what is the last day of school? We can't set it. Until Possibly, unless we get a state waiver, it will be one more day. Yes, exactly. Okay. Our next thing is our proposed school board calendar for next year. I'll start off the discussion. We have one on here for July the 6th. I might suggest that we move that to July the 13th because of July the 4th weekend. Uh, and that could be a work session or a closed session. We do have some issues, you know, we have some uh, things we gotta do at the end of the year for reviews and stuff. We could put it in that uh, thing. So I would recommend we go to September, I'm sorry, July the 13th. And the other question I'd have is down here on December the 21st, um, four days before Christmas, do we wanna have a work session on that day? Can we know. can we deal with July first, sir? Um, I, I, I'm just I'm just mentioning right. my two changes that I feel, and then each board member okay. can chime in. So, so those were the two changes. We I know we'd already talked about the July, and I concur with the December 21. Well, I also need to add in that for the July 27th, we have um, superintendent evaluation. So the board only would meet on July 27th. This is for next school year. I, I understand that. I'm looking at it. Oh. I was going to so, do the superintendent so, on either the 13th or 22nd in closed session on one of those times. The 13th, we would. Oh. The 13th, we would have our regularly scheduled board meeting. Mm -hmm. That probably has a lot going on. The 20th would be. Could we could do it the 20th and move our work session to the 27th, keeping it on Wednesdays. So we could meet the 13th, 20th, and 27th. The evaluation does take a little bit of time. I mean, well, I, if I, we, I, if, if, I mean, it, it, it's up. It could be, of course, to the, the Dr. Salins how much we have on either one of those agendas. But if we neither one of those agendas are really full, we might have enough time to put that in there. Mm -hmm. Correct. And we can always uh, add it. Resume again. at the end of the. At yes. the end of the open session, we can resume to and go add. back into evaluation yes. issues. Yes, we could. Instead of making three. Yeah. Correct. But month. leaving it open as an open option, an open yeah. date. So well, I think if it, as we get closer to June and we set the agenda for the 13th or 20th and find out they're going to both be, we don't have enough time, then we could readdress it at that time. That'd be That's my fine. opinion. But just keeping it tentative. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 13th, 20th, and 27th are, tr are tentative for now. So well, 13, no, 13th is going to 13th is going to be good. 13th and the, and, and be. the 20th is going to be good. Okay, thank you. July. Yes. Okay, farther down, we got July, uh, December the 21st. Comments there? Oh, I think we should cancel. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And then the other meetings, as we usually do, uh, February's filled with uh, budget work sessions. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. So really, it looks like we would change the July the 6th to Ju July the 13th. Um, I'll work with Dr. Salins to try to keep that meeting so we can get the uh, review in there too on closed session. And we have July the 20th work session. Is everybody happy with that proposal? And, yes. we, and And we will delete December the 21st work session, which would be four days prior to Christmas. Perfect. Do you need anything on that or just? Got it. But you got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. We're scheduled for a break, but you just want to push on through? Sure. sure. Yes. Okay. Human resource support. We all had time to look at that? Yes. Yep. Yes. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to accept the human resource and sub bus substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session? Second. I have a motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Okay, Dr. No board policies and regulations to resend. Dr. Noel. Good evening, Mr. Smith, Dr. Salins, members of the board executive team. I'm Michael Knoll, Director of Human Resources. I come before you again this month. Last month I brought forth before you 20 policies and regulations which have served their shelf life here in Queen Anne's County Public School. I come to you tonight to take action on rescinding and removing those policies as we will start to embed these into a regular rotation pattern 
pattern that they will be brought to you for consideration. But for tonight's purposes, I bring the 20 before you that were brought last month for your review for action to be taken. Board Thank members, quick question. What was the reason for rescinding the participation in the community drives, the last one? That policy was dated back to 1993. Mm -hmm. And there are enough community collaborations taking place in our schools now that Thanks. we felt that it was time for that to go away. Thanks. Any other board members have any questions on what will be rescinded? Did I, I had given you a list. Yes, and uh, those, that's for the next review. Those, yes, those exactly. will be incorporated into the next review. Thank you so much. Any further discussion on this one? No. I have I a don't. motion. Sir, I make a motion to rescind the board policies and regula regulations as presented. Second. A motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 It passes. Thank you. Our next one is Dr. Salins. Policy doc 110, Dr. Salins. Yes. Um, so uh, this is a third read and then ask for um, approval to uh, move forward with the policy on policies. Um, I have gone through it, so I um, wasn't going to go through every part of it, but if there's additional questions, I'd be happy to. Um. Yeah, I had a few. I, as I started thinking about it some more, and I'm, and I'm reading where it says that the board considers policy development one of its chief responsibilities. And so I, I, it kind of felt to me reading it with taking out the... Um, the committee, it kind of felt like we were on the back side of policy making as opposed to leading policy making. And so I was just kind of hoping to to shelf this because um, I would like more time to get more information regarding it. Um, like I said, it's one of our main tasks and going through it, it kind of feels like we're further removed from being the lead on policy than um, that I'm really right now comfortable with. So that's just my my piece. Well, the board, of course, ultimately has a final say on any policy as far as what we vote on it. Um, I mean, there is ways to, if the board wants to set a policy or have something to, toward the superintendent, there's a way we can just contact you and say, this is what we like to see or whatever, and it's a policy generated we are seeing it through our you know first second and third read um, yeah I, I, I thought about this but then I also look at it when we have this the board has three times to review this look at it and vote it up or, or vote you know to make changes and then vote it up or down um, I don't have any major heartburn but if, if Helen wants to or any other board members have have it that's you certainly need to voice your opinion about it I think I just I even though I wasn't on the policy commission for long committee and I don't know if, if, if Tammy wants to add on to this but it was really helpful to be um, look to look at the policy in depth and to be a part of that process and to kind of go over all the verbiage it was just a much and even pick which ones we felt like were important um, to do before others. And so because it's such a main task of ours, it, it felt important that someone from the board, it didn't necessarily have to be me, like I said, it was, um, was Michelle on it all, as well before? Anyway, to just be a part of that process of, on that front end of looking at them before we even present to the board. Because what we're presenting to the board is, um, even though there's three looks, it's kind of like saying here, this is our finished product. Now you can fine tune it, but this is kind of, this is a policy we want to look at and this is a policy. And that's all, I just kind of felt like we were more behind it now without it being uh, initiating with one of us being on it than it used to be, if that makes sense. Well, addressing it, I mean, there is the creation of a school system improvement committee and a citizen's advisory committee of which a board member can sit to be Absolutely. a part of the process. Uh -huh. Right, Absolutely. but we don't have those yet. We don't, but they are going to be created by this right. by this policy. Yes, they are created right. by this policy. And, and we've would, already worked on them to articulate a regulation that 
a board that's member all, uh, should that has be all a part the parameters of and the guidelines within that. But I can't get to that process until we get this part approved. You have to approve the policy for me to articulate the SSIC and CAC, like who's on that, how often do they meet, um, what is their charge. And you have no problem with a board member being on it. Oh, I don't. A board member I would, can be on both I would of encourage them if you it. Want. Yes, I would encourage it. Absolutely. So the policy committee was made up of staff, right? Yes. And a board member, if they wanted to serve on the board, or were parents on the policy committee, or? Yes, there were two two parents, different different years. Anybody but, else? Students? No, no. That's why this. I mean, creating these two different committees is very helpful. Is there some reason? Well, I know why creation of the. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I understand the creation it's of really the two. It's really One of them is required by law at least. It is, yeah. you're right, the CAC is, right. mm -hmm, correct. I'm just thinking what was, or what I'd like to know is, was there anything unique about the policy committee no. that's not? It was unique because we were. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of time. Answers the question. It was a okay. lot of time. It really was. It, it, it was a lot of time, and, and it, it took a lot out of uh, the staff's day to uh, to go through this, and I appreciate everyone that I worked with the last couple of years. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I, I'm all for this, the creation. And pretty of much anybody can recommend a policy, obviously, if the board yes. members Absolutely. recommend it. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume be active in the development of the policy Correct. through the advisory committee or with you. Yes. I mean, my, my suggestion would be if we had, if you're going to have, can't have more than two board members on a thing, but if you had Correct. one board member on it and then any board, it would be an open slot. If any board member was going to put a policy in and he wanted to be in that meeting, then you'd, you'd have two well, board members, you know, you'd have up to two. The unique opportunity is that both of those committees are going to hear and do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to have a board member on one and a and, board and member on the other, you're welcome to do that. Then you could see two different perspectives because one is staff and one is really parent parent and community. So you would get two different perspectives. That'd be very helpful since we don't usually have comments from the public. Right, right exactly. And that, I and mean, that would, would be, provide a be very helpful. for that. Any further discussion? Mr. Smith, I make a motion to uh, approve policy 110, policy and regulation development with all its changes. Do you have a second? Second. A motion second. Is any other discussion? Any final discussion on this? All those in favor say aye. 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 Nay. Two, four to one passes. Uh, Miss Towers, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't and we're grateful. <laughs> he didn't sneak out early. <laughs> Uh, good evening again. Tonight we're bringing before you a budget transfer request, and this is for our restricted funds. Our restricted funds is our grant related funds, and since the approval of or the adoption of our approved budget, the adoption of the approved budget was $14,172,521. This amendment brings in, in another $6,655,047. So the restricted budget for this year is $20,827,568. I should not assume this, but this is because of all the free lunches we're giving out and the federal government's paying this. Um, this is actually going to be for the ESSER funds okay. and the American Rescue Plan funds. So attached, um, you'll see the, the breakout of all the different grants that we have. Uh -huh. um, but what you're talking about would go under the Food Service Fund, Fund okay. 5. This is going to be Fund 1. You can only imagine, and I have to give kudos, we have and the excellent grant specialist, Jen Voda, who, when you look at 20827568 for one person to um, manage and, and help with those grants, that's a lot compared to a normal year. It's anywhere between five and seven million dollars. Awesome. We really appreciate her, yes. her endeavor towards helping our school system. Yes. Mr. Smith, I make a motion to approve the transfer request to the restricted budget amendment number one for FY 2022. Or is that six million six hundred and sixty five thousand forty seven dollars? Did I yes. say it right? There you go. Yes, please. Thank you. Budget source restricted funds. Second. Motion is second. All here say aye. 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 aye seven. Thank you. Carl or 
Carter or Mr. Pender? I'll, take, I'll let Carl. Probably don't want this. I'll let Carl do the next four or five. <laughs> Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salem, board members, exec, executive team, for the record, Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. Um, before you tonight to uh, seek a uh, letter of intent for American Bus Sales and Services to purchase two um, new school buses for uh, next year. If you can imagine, um, due to the extended lead time, we are currently looking at six to seven months to get a bus. Um, last year, well, this current year, we were supposed to get it in um, August and we never saw it till November. Um, this is to replace two buses that will be 15 years old that transport um, special needs students. And again, they're county buses. Um, so if we can move forward, we're gonna piggyback on, as we have in the past, the, the larger contract um, for uh, Hartford County, um, contract number 20-JHS-005 um, for physical impact dollar amount of $231,070. And this will come out of the FY23 unrestricted current expense budget. So really, we're not, we're not exchanging money right now. We're just asking to get on the assembly line because like I said, it's about uh, a six to seven month uh, lead time on that. Any questions? Yeah, do we know we're gonna have that much money in the budget for this? Yes. Um, if I can add, this is gonna be under the, the leasing portion. So um, uh, under the next couple of years, we're gonna lease out the buses. We've been in contact with different leasing vendors. We're still too far out. And as far as the rates go, to, even if we wanted to lock them in. So as soon, the closer we get to purchasing the bus, we'll, negoti we'll look at negotiating rates, looking at contracts to piggyback off of and, and get the best deal for, for that. So what this is about is just getting us in the door to get the buses produced. Right. And what we're trying to do is, instead of getting to that year where we need like eight to go out of service, you know, can we branch it off to, 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 to something similar to that to keep it a steady number in the budget? So just out of curiosity, we lease, is that a four year, five year, six year? How does that thing? We're, we're, we're comparing different okay. types to get the best deal. But the bottom line is this is just a placeholder for two buses. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Have a motion. Mr. Smith, I make a motion to uh, for the approval to send a letter of intent to American Bus Sales and Services for the purchase of two school buses. Fiscal impact dollar amount of $231,070. Budget source FY 2023 unrestricted current expense budget. Second. Thank you. Motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Lovely, Carla. <laughs> How you doing, Nicole? Good evening, President Smith, members of the board, Dr. Salins and executive team. My name is Carla Pullen. I am the facilities planner, Queen Anne's County Public Schools. The first item that I have for you this evening is a request to purchase 400 new student chairs at Bayside Elementary School. We have new cafeteria tables that will be delivered there tomorrow, which everyone is very excited about. These chairs are the chairs that are used at the student desks. They are dilapidated. They've been there since 1991. The glide especially have become poor and it's starting to damage the floors. We hopefully will be painting this building as you'll hear in my next request this year and we would love to give them new student chairs as well. So this is a cooperative purchasing item through the mapped contract. The fiscal dollar amount is $34,048. This is budgeted through ESSER 2. Okay, any questions by the board? Entertain a motion. Mr. Smith, I um, ask that you, uh, that we approve the purchase of 400 new student chairs for Bayside Elementary School. Fiscal impact amount is $34,048 in the budget source or ESSER two grant funds. Second. Motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. 
The second item that I bring before you is the letter of intent for interior painting at Bayside Elementary School. So as you know, we are hoping to paint at least one, if not two buildings per year to get back on a regular cycle where we're doing this every seven to 10 years. So this evening we're requesting approval to send a letter of intent to vigil contracting to paint Bayside Elementary School. The date of that service will be from June 15th, the first day students are out. We will expect that to be completed by August 15th. This is also a cooperative purchasing contract through SourceWell. We will be painting all of the interior spaces, the walls, ceilings, door frames, and any previously painted doors or other surfaces. The fiscal dollar amount will be $158,843.19. We are asking for this out of the fiscal year 2023 unrestricted current expense budget. And that is the purpose for requesting a letter of intent. Since the budget is not yet available to us, we would like to get them started on purchasing materials, knowing that July 1st, we would issue that purchase order. And both of these contracts have the $250 a day uh, dam That's correct. damage. If they don't complete it on time, it's the, it says the $250 a day? Yes, okay. that is correct. So we ask them to be done by August 15th. In the past, we have been a little bit flexible. We make sure that all of our classrooms are done. If they have to go a few days extra, we keep them in the gymnasium or the quarters or somewhere that our teachers aren't trying to work and get set up. Now you have on here to be, be completed between June 15th to August 15th, yes. you're saying you're not even gonna get started till July 1st. No, 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 we would start on June 15th with this <laughs> letter of intent. So oh, that would you. allow them to get started, get all of their materials, that purchase order will be struck and we've made sure with the contractors that their billing cycle would not start until after July 1st anyway. Okay. And, and the county should uh, hopefully have their budget struck the first, first week of June. And we hope so. The other thing is, it says, and they're subcontractors, so they have subcontractors, yes. they're bonded yeah. and done everything through them. We don't, I mean, we deal with them, but they're liable. That's correct. That's correct. And the painting subcontractor is Cassidy Painting out of Delaware that we've used on the past four buildings that we've painted, so and they've been very successful. We've been very happy with their performance. Okay. Any other questions? Entertain a motion. Mr. Smith, I make a motion to set our letter of intent to vigil contracting the interior painting of the Bayside Elementary School, fiscal impact dollar amount of $158,843.19. Budget source is the FY 2023 unrestricted current expense budget. Second. Motion second, all those who say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. have it. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Welch is probably jumping up and down right now watching this. <laughs> she is. Mrs. Welch, the principal of Bayside, is probably jumping up and down right now. There you go, Louisa. We're getting you. <laughs> and now we hope to make Mrs. Farnell's date. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know if we can do two of them at the same time. Uh, no. <laughs> Let's get a little pressure on this thing. B comes before C. <laughs> <laughs> So the next item I have for you is a very similar contract. This is a letter of intent for interior painting at Centerville Elementary School with visual contracting as well. This is also through the Gordian Sourcewell contract to repaint all of the interior spaces, walls, ceiling, door frames, and any previously painted doors or other spaces. The dollar amount is $150,606.97. This again would be from our fiscal year 23 budget, and we would be sending a letter of intent to them with the idea we would do a purchase order on July 1st. Can I make a motion, Mr. Smith? Any questions any first? <laughs> you make a motion. No. Thank you, sir. <laughs> make a motion to send a letter of intent to That's get to fine. Mr. Vigil Contracting to paint the interior of the building, Centerville Elementary School. Fiscal impact dollar amount, $150,606.97. Budget source, FY 2023, unrestricted current expense budget. Second. A motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Right, the last item I have for you is the request to process a change order to an existing contract, which is the chiller replacement at Ken Island High School. You're needy tonight. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, this apologize. request is asking for us to be able to utilize JCI as the controls contractor for this project. 
that is to assure that we have consistency with the HVAC there. So we are in the midst of finishing the controls replacement at that school with JCI. The new chiller has to tie into all of these controls. And if there is more than one contractor, more than one different control system, mm -hmm. it will be an absolute nightmare. Part of the reason we're doing the EMS replacement is so that we can get back to one system that is consistent with all of the others that we have within the district and we can make ease of operation much better. So the request for this is a $29,157.45 dollar impact. It was budgeted for any type of overruns within this project. It's over the $25,000 mark, so that's why we bring it to you. Um, but it really will help to assure with that consistency. Boland, at the time of the contract, was not able to get that number from JCI and it put in another contractor, and that just would be disastrous. Well, I have a, I'm sorry. Uh, go, ahead. go right ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Ellen. Um, so when, they, when this was brought to the board before for approval, yes. Was it mentioned that it was going to be disastrous that they had a different contractor in there? I mean, because that's kind of big. At that time, we were not aware of that information. Okay, so did the um, other contractor, was Limbach contacted and made aware that they had won the contract and then subsequently take, told they were taken off? I don't know the answer to that question because it was a contractual issue with them, but we have not had any type of issue from Limbach. And was there not an RFQ date that they had until, I mean, I guess I'm concerned about contracting. It was cooperative rules. purchasing, so no, there wasn't an RFQ that went out. This was this was done through all the parameters of the source well contract. Because okay. I just have a real concern that if it was put forward for us as if they were going to do an okay job, it seems weird now that we're being told it was going to be disastrous. Oh, no, I, I, think, no. I think the question well, is we want consistency of who's, you know, grab. Exactly. No, I understand what you're saying, I'm just, but initially, the contract came forward with a different subcontractor. Yeah, I think hindsight, kind of we should sit there. Maybe we, I don't know if we can in our contract, require that if we have any mechanical something that it be, if there are subcontract controllers out that we list a controller or something. And if it's available in the parameter of that cooperative purchasing contract, we can do that. Technically, that's not in, in our scope to ask because they're working for Boland. So okay. our contract's with Boland. So we didn't have that information at that time. Once we found out that it was proposed to have a different contractor, we said we absolutely need to have JCI on this project. What was so, the total amount of the contract initially? What was the total amount of the contract is 1.43 million, I believe. Okay. And JCI is Johnson Controls. Johnson Controls, mm -hmm. Who Correct. controls all of our schools. They do. So they as well as our fire alarm systems a, now. They, Johnson Controls was in that building from its inception. That's correct. So this should have been seen. No, no, Johnson Controls wasn't at Ken Allen High School. It was in the other. That was uh, that Barbara Coleman, I think, was the Barbara Coleman. Barbara Coleman. Um, oh. okay. And we're, I so thank you. So basically, we've transferred over to Johnson Controls through mm -hmm. the years when we go to upgrade, because what we had was a hodgepodge yeah. of you know, this was controlled by this company, this was controlled by that company when they did renovations, and just trying to get it onto one platform because what you have is the companies start pointing fingers at each other and the people that suffer end up being the students and the staff in the building. Yeah. And this just streamlines it a whole heck of a lot better than what was occurring. But yeah, it was an old Barbara Coleman system that was there. Uh, did Bolin, did they give us a reason why Johnson couldn't respond to the RFQ for four months? Uh, no. And and we didn't inquire. I, I think I, I maybe there were some yeah, yeah there were some items that were happening behind the scenes and and some back and forth that I think made that communication a little bit difficult. And I think Johnson, I'm not his a thing, but they do the county too. I'm pretty sure, don't they? Yes. So it's it's a, it's a company that's well versed and has probably staff here to do it. Yes. So, Any further questions? Yeah, will Boland be on site with this, or are they going to be sending us subcontractors again? No, Boland is on site. Boland is the contractor that is doing all of the replacement. And Boland has done our chiller work mm -hmm. before installing new chillers at Sutlersville Elementary, and, you know, so they're pretty versed in what's going on. Okay. Right. So, so is Boland the lead with some of our Johnson Control people, too? I mean, is Boland, like, the contractor, and JC is a subcontractor yes, for them? Yes, that's correct. Answer to all both of them, whether it be JC or um, or 
Lynn, I'm sorry, Lynn Bach. Bach, they would all answer to Boland? Yes, they all work directly for Boland. And then our contract is directly with Boland. Any further discussion? Do I hear a motion? Mr. Smith, I make a motion to approve the change order to the contract with Boland to utilize JCI as the control system provider for the chiller billerly replacement at Kellen High School. Fiscal impact dollar amount of $29,157.45. Budget source is the FY 2019 capital, county capital funding. Second. I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Nay. I have four uh, and Helen says nay. Thank you. It passes. Thank you. Okay, we have a citizen participation. Anybody? Citizens? Okay, thank you. Uh, future meetings. Um, we will not be meeting on the 20th. We'll be meeting on the 27th for our work session. The 20th with uh, the school would be out for spring break. And then our next regular board meeting is 5 4, May the 4th. Do I have anything else good for the calls? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those who say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.